Hi, John Dixon here from the Centre for Public Christianity. We're talking with Professor John Lennox about science and the Bible. John, do you have to put your scientific brain to one side when you read the Bible, specifically a text like Genesis? Not at all. I don't think I'd be remotely interested in the Bible if you had to put your intelligence aside. One isn't committing intellectual suicide. In fact, I think the scientific approach helps you to take scripture sometimes more seriously than you would if you didn't adopt the scientific approach. Can you give me an example? I can. You referred specifically to Genesis and um, I always smile when people mention Genesis because as a scientist I see how Genesis starts. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and I'm well aware that scripture has been saying that for many, many centuries. But science only caught up with it relatively recently. I mean, I can remember the 1960s when the evidence first started coming in that the universe, that space-time had a beginning. And it was fiercely resisted by some scientists because they said it'll give too much leverage to people who believe in the Bible. So there's one place, the very first words of scripture, which have in that sense been largely vindicated by science. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because the ancient world had a view of an eternal universe. Yes, it did. It did. But the Bible didn't, apparently. And though Aristotle's view of an eternal universe prevailed for centuries in the scientific realm, it was the paradigm. And it has been essentially overthrown. But the worldview of the Bible is, is so ancient. What can it possibly give to us in the 21st century? Well, of course, anciency is not necessarily a measure of untruth. Uh, things can be ancient, but they can also be true. But perhaps behind that question lies the obvious thing that the Bible is not a textbook of science. And usually you find a number of views. One is to say, look, we can read the Bible so long as we don't get it tangled up with science. It's talking about different things. I would largely subscribe to that, but not completely. What I mean by that is this. I think it is fair to say that science normally handles the how questions and the why questions if you're thinking of the why of function. But it doesn't handle why questions, teleological questions, the why of purpose. And scripture certainly deals with those. But at the same time, Scripture does have some things, not many things, to say about this physical universe. For example, in the statement I just quoted, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's talking about the physical universe. So I would expect essential distinctiveness, but an overlap at certain points. And of course, those are the pressure points that everybody's interested in. Your central field, John, is mathematics, uh, which deals with proofs, I'm thinking. Not that I was any good at mathematics, but surely biblical evidences are flimsy when compared to your core field? Well, pure mathematics is an exception. We do deal with proofs, but then what is a proof? It's really a collection of logical arguments based on assuming a certain set of axioms. Now, in no other natural science, let alone in ancient history or the Bible, do you get proof in that sense. But you do get evidence and you do get pointers. And I think one of the best ways to look at this is to realize that science comes in a way in two forms. There's the kind of science we got at school where it was emphasized to us that repeatable experimentation, so on and so forth. It's not always realized clearly enough that when people start to talk, particularly about the past, the origin of the universe and, and so on, that we're not talking in terms of repeatable experiment. We can't repeat the history of the universe to see what happens. We can't repeat the origin of life to see what happens and so on and so forth. But we can use what is called the abductive process, inference to a best explanation. And so the scientist at that level is working very much as a historian works. And I think a historian like yourself would agree that History is not just a collection of very flimsy proofs. We have strong evidence of certain events in past history. But you're quite right in the sense that we need to ask for the evidence. And if a big claim is being made, we'll want correspondingly substantial evidence before we believe it. 
What would it take to convince you that the Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens of the world are right and Christianity is wrong? A great deal because they're wrong about so much. Because they, on the very point that you raise, they are clearly wrong. Doubting, for example, the historicity among scholars of Jesus Christ and so on, and regarding the evidence for Scripture as being no more than that for the Da Vinci Code. That undermines my confidence because although I'm not an expert in ancient history, I know enough about it to realize that that's just nonsense. And so when people of Dawkins and Hitchens ilk resort to that kind of thing, it makes me think that their underlying thesis must be very weak. But if you ask me the question straight, since the heart of the Christian faith for me is really the historical claim that Jesus rose from the dead, they'd have to bring along very substantial evidence that he didn't rise from the dead. But since they don't show the slightest understanding of history, I doubt if they're going to do that.